Um, I didn't get to say who I was. Jim said who I was, so I guess I don't have to. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm on the faculty in the University of Utah. I haven't been here at University of Utah as long as Jim. This is only my 38th year. So he's been here. He's got two years on me. Um, and uh, I started out uh, as an undergraduate at, at Iowa State. And um, actually, at Iowa State University, had a very large isotope contingent. Um, but it was all in the chemistry department. I was a double chemistry geology major there. And I discovered then that I really enjoyed uh, doing uh, stable isotopes. And so that's pretty much the route that I've followed my whole career. So, if, um, and if there's a common theme to my, my research career, it's uh, isotopes being used for everything. And, you know, and so what I want to do in this beginning is give you an idea of of why we have the isotope mix, the general mix that we have. So that's one of the one of the, the principal goals, certainly in this very first part. And again, um, one of the things that uh, that we'll see and is you know confusing to the general public is in fact what are isotopes. Remember we had a problem when we were doing a experiment down in the animal control facility and we were changing the drinking water from Miami drinking water to Salt Lake drinking water. That's it. And somebody came in and said, well, what is this experiment? Oh, it's an isotope switch experiment. Stay, you know, water switch isotope. And they said, oh, if it's an isotope, you have to warn people to stay away because you're using isotopes. We said, no, these are stable isotopes. They said, no, no, isotopes are dangerous. We said, no, these are stable isotopes. Iso all isotopes are dangerous. If you have anything to do with any isotope, you must label things and warn people to stay away. And, we keep saying, well, you know, every atom in the universe is an isotope. <clears throat> okay, so they are your friends. Uh, and, um, you know, here, this is just uh, actually looking out from my front porch when I was on sabbatical a few years ago in, was in Kenya. And water has isotopes. These mangrove swamps have isotopes. The screen has isotopes. Um, the, the ink, uh, no, the ink doesn't because these are electrons. Uh, the sail has isotopes, the boat has isotopes, the people have isotopes, everything has isotopes. And what we're really interested in, in emphasizing in this course is the natural abundances of isotopes, and that's where we're going to go. Uh, okay, uh, my, my talk this morning is going to be in four parts. Uh, the first part, which will be about 15 minutes, this is where I get to play God. We're going to have the first nine billion years of the universe, okay, compressed into 15 minutes. Okay, this is day one. Okay, day two in Genesis <laughs> is how did the Earth become a habitable planet? Okay, so that's going to be the next four and a half billion years. Okay, so that gets us from Big Bang to now. Okay. And I have to do that by 10 o'clock. Okay, so we have 30 minutes to compress 13.8 billion years into your heads. Uh, after the break, we're going to just talk about some common language. And then I'll just give you some background about isotopes in biogeochemistry. And this will just be a little bit about some of the different things that we'll cover in the class. So this is really today to give you some common background but one of the things that, as a, a geologist, I kind of want to want to give you a perspective on some of the the cosmophysics uh, and some of the early history of our planet. Um, all right, first nine billion years of the ice, uh, of, of the planet, and unfortunately, um, the way things are, I might have to do this in only 15 minutes. So. I'll try not to skip anything. Okay, isotopes. Remember, what are these things? You all learned this back in kindergarten, first grade, something like that. Okay, the periodic table of the elements. Okay, and, you know, we all know, you know, that uh, hydrogen, helium. I give this to my undergraduates, and some of them are sitting here in the front row, and they have had this test where you give them the blank periodic table of the elements, fill it in. Okay, and... You know, because you remember where you were in first and second grade, you can do that, okay? 
Um, what we need to think about is, well, what are some of these? What we're interested in is the third dimension to the periodic table of the elements. Okay? Hydrogen has a proton, and we know that if it has one proton only in the atom, it must be hydrogen and can be nothing else. Okay? Uh, however, uh, if it has also a neutron along with that proton, then it's a different species of hydrogen with a different, slightly different atomic mass. Actually, a very different atomic mass goes from one to two because protons and neutrons have about the same mass and electrons have almost no mass. And occasionally we can cram two uh, neutrons in and we have hydrogen three or tritium. So it has three times the mass of this. So if we look at the natural abundances, this is like 99.98 little percent common hydrogen. And then we have this rare hydrogen, deuterium, which is less than 0.02%. And then one, this is one in 10 to the 18th. So the natural abundance in rainwater of tritium is about one in 10 to the 18th of all the hydrogen atoms, things with one proton. That's tritium. And it's the only suite of isotopes we really give separate names, hydrogen, deuterium, tritium. The other one we talked about, carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, the rare radioactive isotope of carbon, uh, nitrogen-14-15, we add an extra neutron, oxygen-16-17 and 18. And of course, we remember, because we know the periodic table by heart, Six protons equals carbon, seven nitrogen, eight protons is oxygen, and we can have a limited number, there's a limited possibility for additional neutrons in a nucleus of an atom. All right, so this is uh, just our friend to think about, and 98.89, 1.11 1 .1 about percent on average, and, of course, carbon-14, the one that everybody has heard about when they think of isotopes, they think, oh, carbon-14, that's how you must date things because, well, that's how you date things if you're in the right system, in the right age. But, again, on planet Earth, the natural abundance of carbon-14 in the atmosphere is about 1 in 10 to the 12th atoms. Tiny, tiny, you can measure it, but uh, not here in the state of Utah. Okay, we remember these nuclide definitions because we got those in second grade. Uh, and uh, I'm just putting these down because they might be handy. So this is just a list of handy things and at the, it's repeated at the end of the notes. But you may need as you come back and we think about things in the class to go back and think about some of these things. Okay, remember that an important uh, little rule we have is an atomic mass uh, is discussed in atomic mass units. So a proton has about one atomic mass unit. And interestingly, this atomic mass unit is defined by, so by definition, one atomic mass unit is one twelfth of the mass of carbon-12. Okay, that is an atomic mass unit. And this represents a great, one of the greatest compromises in science. In 1965, up until 1965, the physicists had one definition for mass and the chemists had a different definition. Okay, this is like in Europe when you're crossing through the channel. You know, do you drive on the right side of the road or the left side of the road? You can have serious bad things happen if you are, have different definitions for things like driving, which is the correct side of the road to drive on. So the Chemists said, oh, well, let's have the, the uh, atomic mass be defined as 1 16th, oh, actually, I think it was of 1 12th of the carbon, of, of carbon atoms. But of course, there are several species of carbon. And the, and the physicists were saying, no, 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 let's do 1 16th of oxygen 16. And the only way you could, you have to, in a compromise, everybody has to give a little bit of ground. So they say, okay, we'll take carbon from the chemists and we'll take the isotope notion from the physicist 
And so we'll have this common definition. So in 19, from 1967 onwards, everyone has agreed an atomic mass unit is this 1 12th of a carbon 12th. And this is what it is in kilograms or million electron volts. And that's just a tiny little number that we don't need to worry about. Okay. Another important thing is atomic number Z is the number of protons in a nucleus. And of course, you remember, oh, carbon six, six protons equals carbon. And then, of course, there's some other things. Uh, the important thing to remember is an electron is a tiny, tiny, weensy little bit of, a, uh, of an atomic mass unit. So it's about almost 1 2,000th of an atomic mass unit. So the electrons don't contribute significantly to the mass. A um, couple of other things. Okay, an isobar. These are just alphabetical, so I'm wandering through them. Isobar, same atomic mass, different atomic number. Ooh, my goodness. What could that be? That could be carbon-14 and nitrogen-14. So both 14. So atomic mass, an isomer. These, this will become interesting and important. This will be a definition you'll have to come to. This is one or more nuclides having the same mass number, A, so let's say carbon-14, and same Z, but different measurable times in different quantum states with different energies. Ooh, this is complicated. And actually, carbon-14 doesn't have any isomers. But an isomer is, so if we have one energy level, OK, you remember that if you add all of the energy together in an in a isotope, it has an energy level. It can actually move to a lower energy level. And it does that by giving off a gamma ray. OK, so this isomer just represents different energy levels. And this must be a radioactive thing if it has more than one isomer. Uh, don't worry about an isotone. Isotope, OK, this is just nuclides having the same number of protons with different number of neutrons. And we know what that is. That's what we're talking about. But these other definitions are useful conceptual things that we'll come back to in a second. Oh, my goodness. Isotopolog. Complicated. Okay, this is an isotope species, same molecule. Okay, so carbon has 12 different combinations of stable isotopes. Okay, carbon dioxide. Okay, so an isotopolog is if we need to keep track of all of those different species. And this is probably something that only half of you have heard of before. Okay. But an isotopolog is going to be a very important topic of Naomi Levin's lecture in uh, Thursday, uh, Thursday a week from now. Okay, she will show what happens if you can measure not only this. We so this is one that we commonly think about. This is another one we commonly think about: carbon, oxygen, carbon common, oxygen common. Oxygen rare. Okay, so we like to just compare that to that. And carbon rare with all the <coughs> common oxygen. And we like to compare that to this one. Okay, so normally we just look at the two most, uh, the sort of the two most common and rare abundances. But we'll see sometimes you can get a very weird combination. Here is. Uh, Heavy carbon, so rare carbon, and rare oxygen coupled together. Okay, this is a new field of isotope geochemistry that has developed in the last 10 years. And we're still learning the rules. And Katie Snell is going to be giving a lecture on this topic. <clears throat> okay, uh, isotopomers are yet another word you're going to have to learn. And you'll come back to this uh, throughout the, through the course later, and I'm not going to worry about it now. OK. Uh, OK, the other important thing to remember, neutrons and protons have a close to the same atomic masses. OK, so 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. But they're slightly different. All right. So these both have an atomic mass of almost 1. OK, so the mass number is the key. And that's just the sum of protons and neutrons. Well, where does this lead us 
into some interesting places, I would say. Here's our masses. Electrons, how many atomic mass units? One over 2,000 about. Sir? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, one over almost 2,000, so it doesn't really contribute. Proton, one over 1.007. Neutron, 1.008. And we immediately begin to see there's a bit of an issue here because we thought, how many protons are there in carbon-12? Six. six. How many neutrons? Six. six. So six times this plus six times this divided by 12 is one. Cannot be one. Okay. Deuterium has a proton plus a neutron. So 1.007 plus 1.008 equals 1.007? How does that happen? So where's the missing mass? How can we do that? Okay, this is the binding energy of the nucleus. Okay, this is why the sun shines. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so this missing mass is the binding energy of the nucleus, and it will explain why we have this family of not only stable isotopes in yellow, but all of the other isotopes which we have observed on our planet. Okay, these isotopes, the, the ones in yellow are the stable isotopes. Okay, the ones in uh, the white boxes are isotopes we have observed on planet Earth. Some of these are naturally occurring. This is naturally occurring radioactive. Uh, uh, beryllium-7 is naturally occurring radioactive. Beryllium-10, naturally occurring radioactive. Uh, and these are actually made in the atmosphere by cosmic rays, as is helium-103. Uh, some of these others at the limbs, like helium-8, that's made in nuclear reactors or accelerators, okay? But we've seen it. We know it exists stably for a short period of time uh, because we, we can actually make it. 